This is episode 585 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I'm very pleased to be joined this week by Philip K. Howard. He is a prolific author and recently came out with a book called Everyday Freedom, uh, Designing the Framework for a Flourishing Society. Uh, welcome back to Tipping Point New Mexico, Philip. Nice to be with you, Paul. Yeah, now uh, we've had you on the show before, and uh, you seem to be uh, at a Stephen King-esque pace when it comes to producing <laughs> books. Maybe not on a on a word <laughs> per word basis. King's books tend to run quite long, but uh, you definitely uh, uh, must be able to put pen to paper or uh, or typewriter to paper very uh, effectively because. You, you've uh, written a number of books, and uh, they're all very good and interesting, and I broadly find myself agreeing with uh, what you're saying. But uh, uh, talk about you know just your, your authorship and uh, what got you engaged in some of these projects. Yeah, every time I write a book, I vow I'll never write another one. It's, <laughs> uh, um, uh, you know, I, got, uh, I was uh, a lawyer and civic leader in New York. I was running a, a chair of a large civic organization in New York City, the group that saved Grand Central Terminal, that sort of thing. And uh, as I was, this was in the 80s and 90s. And, uh, and I kept looking at my friends who were in government and wondering why they, act, act, why they couldn't do what they thought was right. And so I started looking into it, and I got really interested, and I ended up hiring uh, the brother of a friend who is an intellectual historian at Claremont, getting his PhD, and give me a tutorial in in political philosophy. You know, I was in my forties at this point, and uh, anyway, so it, that ended up becoming a book called "The Death of Common Sense," which was a big bestseller in 1995. And I've really sort of uh, uh, kind of drilled down into this one idea, which is. Why is it that we don't let human beings act on their best judgment? And, um, you know, modern structures are, are like a giant conspiracy against human freedom, particularly freedom in people's daily choices, you know, the teacher running the classroom, that sort of thing. So, so in one, one way or another, all of my books address that problem. I mean, the book I wrote, I wrote a book last year called Not Accountable about um, public employee unions. And what they've done is that they've, through collective bargaining agreements, taken control of the operating machinery of government so that we elect a mayor who has no authority to fix a broken school. Well, what's, you know, what's democracy for if you can't, or, or, to, or to run the sanitation services more efficiently and save money for taxpayers? Literally, they have no authority. So, so, so democracy can't work. And um, so that's what that book was about. The, the new book, Everyday Freedom, actually was sort of an accident. It came out of a, a forum. I have an appointment at Columbia University in, um, in a branch of the economics department. And uh, I hosted a forum on human agency with a couple of Nobel Prize winners and uh, people like Neil Ferguson, the historian, and others last year. And uh, I'd written an essay for it, and I was going to publish it, and I kept working on it, and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And so finally, I said, well, this is not really an essay. It's a it's a very short book. And so that's what this is. So when I look at your book, Everyday Freedom, and you know specifically the, you know, I forget what the uh, the, the term is for it, but the subtitle, I guess, designing the framework for a flourishing society. So I, I look at that, and uh, you know, I'm pretty uh, libertarian fellow, constitutional conservative, if you will. And I look at that and say, well, that's the U.S. Constitution. Uh, how would you say that your uh, broader philosophy, and especially your philosophy as expressed in everyday freedom, plays into the Constitution? Are you talking about restoring the constitution? Are you kind of looking at filling in the gaps where uh, the constitution doesn't speak to various items? What What is your broader philosophy 
you know, when you talk about the it's, United States as a constitutional republic. Yeah, it's it's about restoring the principles of the Constitution. The Constitution is a framework of of goals and principles and authority structures. And it's activated by people we elect or appoint, in the case of judges, taking responsibility to make those decisions. And it's worked tolerably well for over 200 years. And uh, the, the current operating structure of government in this country, not only the federal government, but also in most states, is uh, was completely rewritten after the 1960s to um, with a different philosophy it, that, that that law would not only tell people what their goals were and have authority mechanisms to hold them accountable, but would tell people exactly how to do things. And it has three main tools that it uses to do that. But it causes failure because it's become a version of central planning and it drives people crazy. It's what accounts for the popular. It's, it, it, it's what accounts for the failure of schools and you know, the inability to build infrastructure and everything else. But it also accounts, I think, for the populist resentment that Americans people feel. Americans hate Big Brother and they hate it not because in my view, not because or just because taxes are too high or, or whatever. They hate it because it's jamming values down their throat every day. You know, what's your preferred pronoun? <laughs> uh, you can't tell a joke in the workplace. Anything you say might result in a lawsuit. You know, it's just it's just people feel suffocated by it. Well, I. I certainly agree with you in that uh, regard. I, I guess in your writing and your research on these issues, um, this is obviously something that has been around for a few decades. Do you point to any specific time frame when government really started to, and this broader philosophical underpinning of government, which took responsibility and decision making away from individuals and Put it in the hands of bureaucrats was it the new deal the great society was it the you know kind of the countercultural movement of the 60s and 70s uh you know do you just say it's an accumulation of uh, uh of things that have happened over time and not one specific era what where do you see kind of uh this situation starting to go wrong and uh and, and how do we pull back on that well, it, it 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 came out of the 1960s. I mean, there was there was explicit. There was no such thing as thousand page rule books before the 1960s. So the 1960s, uh, we woke up to a, a number of abuses of authority, segregation, pollution, unsafe cars, etc. And so uh, that required. Uh, and led to a change in governing values, which was, in my view, fine. But people, the experts at the time, didn't didn't um, want there to be any. They wanted to guarantee there are no more abuses of authority. So, so they came up with the idea that that in the age of the computer, law could be like a software program. So they had three new tools that were devised only after the sixties. First was precise rules. So, you know, the Worker Safety Agency has a thousand, maybe like four thousand rules. Tools, um, stairwells shall be lit by natural or artificial light. <laughs> you know, um, you know that's completely self-evident. You you could put you know thousands of the, those rules into one principle: tools and equipment shall be reasonably suited for the use intended. That's all you need. That's how the Constitution would do it. But that's not how the Worker Safety Agency does it. The second technique they used was um, the idea of legal processes where people could prove that their decisions were correct. So like for personnel decisions, you have to prove that it was fair or not unfair. Well, how do you prove somebody doesn't try hard or has bad judgment or doesn't get along with other people or bores the students or anything else? Most judgments in life are not matters of objective proof. They're matters of perception and judgment. 
those judgments can be second guessed by other people, but they can't be proved in a legal hearing. So we've got this sort of perpetual motion machine in, in well, personnel, it's like no accountability, right? In the case of environmental law, you know, the environmental review statements have become sort of a no pebble left unturned, right? So these go on for thousands of pages, they can take 10 years or longer. And, and so nothing gets built, it's, cra it's literally crazy. Uh, and the third thing we, the third quote innovation of the 1960s was a change in the idea of individual rights. So the rights that the Constitution gave us were rights against the coercive power of the state. Government can't take your property away or put you in jail without due process of law. Those are our rights. The new rights, those were a shield. The new rights are a sword. Any person who doesn't like a decision by a manager, for example, can sue, claiming it was unfair. Well, what about the rights of the manager? It's his job to manage. And um, so the combination of those three things, plus you throw in public unions and a few interest groups, mean that we've got a society where people, where government can't work and by, where increasingly people um, feel that decisions are jammed down their throats that they don't agree with, or they're, you know, doctors and nurses spend half the day filling out forms instead of taking care of patients because of this, this kind of micromanagement thing. I'll just give you an example there. Um, a doctor a friend of mine was kept uh, having the, the reimbursement form bounced by the medical insurance company, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally got a real person on the line said, why do you keep bouncing this form? And the, uh, the, the insurance person on the other line said, because you didn't check the box, did you ask the patient whether she was a smoker? To which the doctor replied, I didn't check the box because the patient is two years old. Uh, you know, yeah. so, so you have this kind of central planning system where it's just, it yanks people out of their, the smart part of their brain and, and causes burnout. And it's just horrible. The system we've created, it's hateful. So, I, I mean, I agree with 100% of what you're saying. I, my only pushback is, you know, the 60s is obviously an era where some of these forces really became uh, more widespread and more powerful. But, you know, I look at, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson and the progressive era, and especially the Wilsonian idea that the founding fathers were not, you know, particularly great group, that they their philosophical approach to government was... Uh, not scientific and that we needed this bureaucratic slash be, you know, really uh, highly trained class of bureaucrats and whatnot to manage government and uh, that it shouldn't be about individual liberty and uh, the broader philosophical uh, you know, underpinnings of the U.S. Constitution. And obviously, things didn't truly go off the rails in, say, like 1925, but we did kind of start this process in my estimation it really got uh heading down the tracks in that progressive era and then kicked off into the new deal which um you know really expanded government in a way uh that was not healthy i don't think for democracy and uh our economy well you know i think it's pretty important to distinguish between uh the scope of government and how government works. I think there's a lot to, that you have to say that's right about the um, um, about government uh, getting into areas that are completely counterproductive. If you look, if you did a, you, you you could do a spring cleaning of government and get rid of half the programs, and nobody would even notice. You know, it was just save money, and so. Uh, and that hasn't happened in years. Um, I've I've written about how, you know, with changing ten programs could uh, that everybody knows are broken would save a trillion dollars a year. So it's it's um, it, it's it, you know there's clearly a lot that government does that it, that it shouldn't do. But 
but workers safe, but the but the progressive era didn't come out of nothing. You know, factory mm. owners were mangling workers. There were unsafe, there were unsanitary conditions in the sausage factories in Chicago or whatever that Upton Sinclair wrote about in the jungle. So, so the question is, whatever government does, it ought to do in a way that isn't stupid. And 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 what's happened, for example, with worker safety is that worker safety laws are probably uh, at this point are counterproductive to safety. That that most workplaces have an incentive to have safe workplaces because of workers' comp laws and others that make them pay if they have unsafe records. That's why when you're on boards, you're, you know, how many days without an incident and all that kind of stuff. And so um, uh, the worker safety laws really ought to be turned into something more like the Constitution and the Worker Safety Agency, um, which I think probably should still exist, should focus on unsafe industries, which there are some. Um, but that's not how it works. It works stupidly and counterproductively. So, um, you know, I've, 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 in general, I've tried to avoid the debate over uh, the scope of government because I think the bigger problem is the idiocy of government. But, but, but there are issues in both ways, in, in both directions. Well, I want to unpack that a little bit, but I really do want to ask you about, um, you've got a lot of quotes from prominent folks, Jonathan Haidt, uh, you know, uh, the Righteous Minds author, Glenn Hubbard, um, a lot of other folks that I would say, broadly speaking, a lot of conservatives will find uh, gratifying, but you, you have Will Marshall, uh, founder and president of the Progressive Policy Institute, and um, you know, just looking at it objectively, my view is that your message tends to uh, be be very appealing to guys and gals like me. You know, uh, center right, uh, liberty oriented kind of folks. Uh, how do you appeal to the progressives? Because I I gather that that has to be at least a a part of what you're trying to do here yeah. is to bring some of those folks who have a lot of faith in government to the side of, hey, let's uh, let's make things work a lot better. Right. So, um, yeah, if I had dinner with a Democratic congressman last night, it couldn't have been, couldn't have been smarter, uh, Seth Moulton from Massachusetts, sort of a centrist Democrat. Uh, the, uh, I think that sensible Democrats understand that, that government is incredibly ineffective <laughs> and is alienating large portions of the population so that if they want to win elections they need to speak to these people and that means uh creating a system where where broken schools can be fixed where transmission power lines can be built in a year not in 10 or 20 years um where doctors and nurses don't spend half the day filling out forms and you know all the all the things you know we've been talking about so so they will disagree with you and perhaps me, but certainly you on on what the scope of environmental regulation should be. But but they will tend to agree that whatever government does, it shouldn't be stupid. So, you know, that's you know, there's a there's an interesting point we should talk about, which is the role of authority in a free society. And both liberals and conservatives have had a real problem with this over the years. And 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 what I write about is um, uh, yeah, goes against the grain of traditional conservative ideology in this respect. Uh, it's it, it's it's often been thought that authority is is the enemy of freedom. It's like a it's like a um, uh, you know, sort of a fixed formula: the more authority, the less freedom. And there are case, there are situations where that's the case, but in any organizational setting, um, unless there is authority, the people underneath the organization, including citizens, actually won't be free to do what's right. 
uh, because they don't know where they stand and there's no mutual trust and such. So, so it's really important um, for the principal of a school <laughs> to have authority to make decisions because then the teachers know that standards will be upheld because no one, people can't slack off and do a lousy job. And the parents have somebody to go to who can act on their ideas. And if nobody has authority, then the organization can't work. So authority is actually not the enemy of freedom in an organizational setting. It's, it's the prerequisite to freedom. Well, I agree with you on that. And I guess we can uh, jump into the whole public education uh, situation because, you know, when I was getting my you know, early experience in public policy, uh, pretty much all the attention was focused on K-12 system. A lot of people thought higher education was, was just fine. Um, I think that situation has taken a dramatic turn, but, uh, you know, the monopolistic structure of the K-12 system seems to be a big part of the problem. Follow that up with uh, too many different interest groups that kind of dominate uh, K-12, whether it's the, the unions or uh, federal rules and regulations. Um, you know, in New Mexico, we don't have a property tax funded education system. It's much more of a statewide funding formula. So you get these conflicts between local control and what the state bureaucracy wants. Um, you know, my view is that government's incapable and maybe this is too libertarian, probably probably too libertarian for you, but uh, the government should get enti entirely out of the education delivery business and uh, they could continue to fund education through systems of vouchers right. and other kinds of uh, you know financial tools uh what what's your uh, approach to education that will uh where are those circles yeah I, I i i think getting government out of it would 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 result in much better much better schools i mean because the schools are so lousy now the the government run schools so you know charter schools uh, most charter schools are are better uh vouchers would be good um you know anything that wor what works is good to me right and the current system doesn't work, I think, in part because of, of uh, a kind of a bureaucratic overload that comes out of the, particularly out of the federal government, you know, and, you know, all those forms that people have to fill out and comply, rules they have to comply with, <laughs> who reads all those forms? You know, where do they go? And then there are, you know, it's just that massive bureaucracies exist only to look at forms. And then you look at the people who are looking at the forms, right? So um, there was a, 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 a few years ago, someone did a study in New York City. New York City, I forget, had, you know, X million public school students. And they had something like several hundred thousand people in the Department of Education. I mean, it's like a huge number of people. And, uh, and the, uh, the Catholic school system in New York had, I think, one quarter as many students and had 20 people in oversight, you know, like you're completely, and, and of course work much better. So, so yeah, we should get, we should, well, we've got to get rid of the unions. I've, I argue in my book, Not Accountable, the unions should be unconstitutional. And I'm trying to develop those arguments right now because they, they because they rendered democracy useless. Um, Just to be clear, let me let me interrupt that that you're referring to government sector unions, uh, not private sector unions. Right. Teachers unions and, and bureaucratic unions and such, you know, where. Where not only is there no accountability, there was a study in Illinois that showed over 18 year study that showed that an average of two out of ninety five thousand teachers a year were dismissed for poor performance. Two out of 95,000 over an 18 year period. That's actually twice the rate as in California. So, I mean, you, you, literally zero accountability. So you go into a school and you know that how badly you do doesn't matter. New York City, a convicted cocaine dealer was required to be reinstated as a teacher. You know, it's like this craziness. And then, and then if you want to sort of 
you know, sort of uh, redirect resources in a school if you're a principal or manage people differently. All that has to be negotiated with the union. So there's literally no authority to, to manage a school or to manage a public agency. And the federal government, um, if you want to change how, who sits at what desk, that's got to be negotiated with the union. <laughs> you know? It's like, it, it, it's, it's like, what's the point of having a manager? No wonder government works so badly. So, um, but yes, I think charter schools, vouchers, all those things are good. And, um, you know, give back a sense of agency to parents and, uh, and to communities. Well, I, I definitely agree with you on that. And uh, the fact that you got a, uh, a progressive policy Institute uh, signer for your uh, book to say, you know, that they enjoyed it and uh, that they endorsed it. That's uh, very impressive because, you know, the, uh, the unions really do dominate the education system in especially blue States like, like mine, New Mexico here, but other States and uh, they have disproportionate uh, impact on the public policy making of uh, of the education system. Yes, but and it, and that's because there it's it's a corrupt system. Just to be clear, let's just finish sure. the loop here. It's not just because they have control; it's because they've harnessed the mass of government in terms of all the public employees and how big it is, with you know dues of about a thousand dollars a year. And what are those dues used for? They're not used for benefits. The benefits are all paid for for the government. Most of those dues are for political activity. So the unions amass in total over five in this country, $5 billion a year, most of which is spent for political activity. And they use it to get people elected who have a statutory duty to collectively bargain with them. So they're giving million, millions of dollars in, in many cases to candidates for big city mayor or governors who then, after they're elected, are supposed to sit down and negotiate a deal in the public interest with the union. Well, guess what? They're not sitting on different sides of the table. They're sitting on the same side of the table. It's not a negotiation. It's a payoff. If it were in the private sector, they would all be in jail. It's unlawful for a private sector union to give benefits to corporate managers. It's unlawful. It's corruption. So why isn't it corruption in the public sector? I could not agree more. Uh, I guess I would advocate or ask uh, a question in a different direction, though. You talk about you know, uh, framework for a flourishing society, and I would argue that you know, while a lot of the constitutional checks and balances and a lot of the things that we put in, that were put into the constitution haven't necessarily stood the test of time. One of the things that really has the idea of, at least in many ways, and that federalism even applies to labor law, there are very different approaches to public sector unions and uh, other negotiating um, you know, kind of public employees across the 50 states. Uh, how do you see federalism fitting into your argument and the framework? Is is that something that you uh, value and emphasize or what? what's your take on yes. the 50 states? Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, really good question. So, so in, in general, I'm calling for uh, a removal of sort of command and control you know, regulatory systems into frameworks more like the Constitution that are activated by people taking responsibility because the people can use their common sense to be accountable for how they're doing in general. But it's really important the 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 doctrine of subsidiary push subsidiarity pushing responsibility down to the lowest level. Not just states, but in my view, communities ought to have much more authority to 
deal with social services, would deal with school, certainly, but deal with social services, homelessness. I would give more authority, and I write about this in Everyday Freedom, more authority to religious organizations, churches and synagogues. You know, we have this sort of crazy idea of separation of church and state, where you're not allowed to deliver services if you mention God or something. You know, that that's not creating the establishment of religion. It's people, my father was a minister growing up. You know, most of his work was taking care of the needy. And, um, you know, that's a place where where Tocqueville wrote, you know, that this is this is one of the great virtues of America is that is that Americans have a sense of ownership for their community. Well, you don't have a sense of ownership if you have big brother dictating how to do everything. So you've got to have communities given back. I, I'm fine with government giving money to the community to take care of the homeless. I'm fine with government overseeing it to make sure there are no abuses or something. But I'm not fine with government telling you how to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with you on private charity and, uh, you know, that that whole issue comes right into uh, the homeless problem, I think we face as a society that's gone, you know, gotten incredibly bad and, you know, keeps getting worse, it seems. Uh, and there's talk among people I've, I've talked with about the homeless problem of, uh, you know, the homeless industrial complex and, uh, you know, the way that <laughs> government funding works. Now there seems to be an immigration uh, industrial complex where organizations rely on federal dollars to essentially uh, smuggle immigrants into the United States uh, illegally. And uh, it just seems like the federal government has its finger in every single area of our lives and it creates crisis after crisis after crisis. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's, um, you, you know, the, the, there are these industries that exist to perpetuate the current uh, maelstrom. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, talking about immigration. So you, you can't discourage immigration unless there's a reasonable probability, not probability, a reasonable likelihood of some kind, let's say 25% chance, that you'll get sent back to where you came from. Otherwise, there's no disincentive for not coming, right? So, so that's just that's just human nature. You know, people have we have to change our policy to 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 do that. Instead, we don't send back anyone, basically, or almost anyone. Um, it, it, and and you've got to have a legal system that's practical for processing people and making judgments, which will often be tough about whether people really are fleeing, you know, terrorism or something. Uh, or or whether they're here for reasons that aren't valid. And that can't be a five-year trial. That's got to be, you know, practical given the numbers involved. And and we have no, no one in government coming to grips with the reality of the problem. And coming up with a pro in wartime, you don't, <laughs> you can't sit there and and, and debate should you fire in this direction or that direction, you know, you've got to fire because you're in wartime. Well, in a crisis like the immigration crisis, you can't sit there and 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 wring our hands over each one of how many millions of people coming in every year? You know, you know, it, you know we just can't do that. Right. Well, um, we're unfortunately coming to ends of our time together, and I want to give you this opportunity to either uh, highlight something that we didn't talk about that you think is critical to your book or to emphasize points or uh, throw something out there that uh, you really feel needs to be addressed before we conclude our conversation. So uh, any uh, anything that you want to highlight? Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you, Paul. And thanks for this discussion. Uh, um, so, so in everyday freedom, what I argue is that America is not just suffering from a problem of leadership, is that we're suffering from system failure, that we've created a system, an operating system for government that, that is actually designed to disempower people from using their common sense. It is designed to make people follow rules instead of 
taking care of the problem at hand, designed to make people go through years of hearing, designed to uh, mollify the lowest common denominator, whoever the squeaky wheel is in your office or anywhere else or, or in your community who demands something for themselves, which everybody knows is unfair and selfish. And so it's driving people crazy. It's contributing to the culture wars that we're in. And the only solution is to accept the fact that this system has failed and that we have to replace it with one more like the Constitution that's activated by humans taking responsibility. Let people do things in their own way and then be accountable for how they do. That's what America is about. We have lost it and we can't get it back without actually area by area simplifying the system and making it work for real people. Perfect. That's a great way to conclude. And uh, I just want to add that, you know, people ask me how I uh, tolerate or uh, maintain my mental health uh, working in a, <laughs> in a blue state that seems to be going further and further out to the uh, left wing. And, uh, you know, I appreciate somebody like yourself who also is tenacious and keeps producing new material, new ideas, new ways to argue the case for essentially, uh, you know, a, a flourishing society and uh, making uh, America, you know, realize its potential. And uh, it's challenging. It's frustrating when things seem to be slipping in the opposite direction. But uh, I, I appreciate your tenaciousness. And uh, folks, you can go find uh, Everyday Freedom. Uh, that's Designing the Framework for a Flourishing Society by Philip K. Howard at uh, Finer Bookstores. And I know you have a website uh, as well. So uh, yeah, commongood.org. Okay. And that's your, is that a think tank? Uh, I know that's yeah, yeah, it's, if it's a small over. think tank, yeah. Perfect. All right, Philip. Well, thanks for your time today and uh, check it out, folks. Uh, right. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointsnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to the show at Apple, Stitcher, or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path 3 Marketing for producing this show.